Summary of Answers On the question of the meaning of life, we've reviewed answers from ancient civilizations, world religions, and philosophical traditions. We're left with a smattering of answers, with no clear consensus. But despite a lack of consensus, we have noticed common themes. Live virtuously, the ancient Egyptians and Thomas Aquinas say we ought to live a virtuous life, with the promise of a happy and eternal afterlife. Confucianism says virtue leads to a happier and more peaceful life here on earth. Hinduism considers it a duty, Dharma. Enjoy life, the ancient Sumerians say we should eat, drink, and be merry. The Hindus call this karma, Aristotle called it happiness, Epicurus and Shantideva called it pleasure. Liberalism recognized self-defined pursuits of happiness. Utilitarianism advocates maximizing happiness. Reduce suffering, this is the primary objective in Buddhism, and also advocated by Shantideva and utilitarians. It is implicit in humanism and naturalistic pantheism, whose ethics say we must respect life. Develop and grow, the ancient Persians said the purpose of life is to collect experiences for the fight of good versus evil. Plato said it is to gain knowledge of the good. The Mormons say it to gain experience and develop ourselves to experience the fullness of joy. Sikhism says life's purpose is to learn and for our soul to blossom forth in lush profusion. Confucianism says we can find meaning in ordinary human experience. Improve the world, Judaism says working to build a better world is the primary aim of life. Hinduism recognizes the importance of work, Arta. The aim of Confucianism is to fashion a harmonious society. Shinto says humanity's purpose is to be a self-developing creative spirit on earth. Thomas Aquinas says on earth, our purpose is to be productive of good works. Naturalistic pantheism says to revere the natural environment. Love others, Christianity says to love thy neighbor as yourself, Islam advocates charity and wishing for your brother what you wish for yourself. Confucius says what you do not wish for yourself, do not do to others. Taoism says to see and love the world as yourself. Humanism preaches aspiring to the greater good of humanity. Divine Union, many religions say the final aim of life is to realize a oneness with God or to otherwise reunite or merge with God. Hindus call this moksha. Taoists say all things return to their source. Sikhs say we will merge into the one from whom we came. Thomas Aquinas says perfect happiness exists only in a union with God. Islam says happiness in the afterlife depends on one's proximity to God. These purported meanings of life all sound like noble aims. But which, if any, is right? Could there be, as the Hindus say, multiple answers? All these answers appear to dance around something more fundamental, a common theme. But what unifying principle connects them? A unifying principle. At first glance, the many answers we've found to the question of life's meaning seem quite different. But stepping back, a clear view comes into focus, and we can see the forest for the trees. Across every answer there is broad agreement on favoring certain paths, in choosing happiness over suffering, pleasure over pain, life over death, saving the world over destroying it, virtue over vice, truth over lies, justice over injustice, beauty over ugliness, order over chaos, proximity to God over distance from God. All these preferences embody pursuit of what is valued, what we call good. We could say the meaning of life rests in maximizing good, good for oneself, good for others, and good for the world. But from where does goodness originate? 
What makes one thing good and another bad? As it happens, there is an object in reality from which all goodness and badness derives. It is also the source of all meaning to all creatures. Without it, there would be no meaning at all. The Origin of Good The good is anything useful, valuable, or worthwhile to someone. Under this definition we can find some good in any technology considered useful, in any item of value people spend money to acquire, or in any human endeavor considered worth doing. For example, we can say a life-saving medicine is useful, houses are valuable, and making art is worthwhile. Why are these things good? A Supreme Good 2360 years ago, Aristotle noticed something strange, if you repeatedly ask, why is that thing good, it leads to a chain of questions and answers. Oddly, this chain does not continue forever. It always ends at the same place, in something that just is good, a thing good for its own sake. Quote. Every art and every investigation, and likewise every practical pursuit or undertaking, seems to aim at some good, hence it has been well said that the good is that at which all things aim, but as there are numerous pursuits and arts and sciences, it follows that their ends are correspondingly numerous, for instance, the end of the science of medicine is health, that of the art of shipbuilding a vessel, that of strategy victory, that of domestic economy wealth. If therefore among the ends at which our actions aim there be one which we will for its own sake, while we will the others only for the sake of this, and if we do not choose everything for the sake of something else, which would obviously result in a process ad infinitum, so that all desire would be futile and vain, it is clear that this one ultimate end must be the good, and indeed the supreme good. End quote. Aristotle in Nicomachean Ethics, 340 BC. What form does this supreme good take? Tracking down the supreme good. Let's try some examples. We can use the previous examples of medicine, houses, and art, but if Aristotle is right, it works starting from anything good. Try some of your own examples and see. Example 1, Medicine. Why is life-saving medicine good? Because it saves people's lives. Why is saving people's lives good? Because it allows them to live longer. Why is living longer good? Because it allows them to have more experiences. Why is having more experiences good? It just is. Example 2, Housing. Why are houses good? Because they protect people from the elements. Why is protection from the elements good? Because it keeps people comfortable and prevents sickness. Why is being comfortable and healthy good? Because it provides for better experiences. Why is having better experiences good? It just is. Example 3, Art. Why is making art good? Because it leads to more art. Why is more art good? Because it gives people novel perspectives, feelings, and thoughts. Why are novel perspectives, feelings, and thoughts good? Because it creates more variety of experiences. Why is more variety of experiences good? It just is. The Supreme Good Found The dictionary defines good as a benefit or advantage to someone or something. According to this definition, a good thing must not only provide some benefit, it must also provide a benefit to someone. We confirmed this in our examples. Regardless of where we began, each case ends in a just is at the point of augmenting experience, thoughts, feelings, perceptions, in other words, consciousness. 
without conscious beings, there would be no someones to receive any benefit. No one would notice, never mind appreciate, any good thing. If not for consciousness, there could be no good. But if conscious experience is the source of value, what does that say of the supreme good? Might conscious experience be the foundation of all value? Is improving states of consciousness the source of all good and rightful action? Is harming consciousness the source of evil and immoral action? Over the centuries, some philosophers have suspected that mind, sensations, or consciousness are the basis of all good and evil. Quote. For these words of good, evil, and contemptible, are ever used with relation to the person that useth them, there being nothing simply and absolutely so, nor any common rule of good and evil, to be taken from the nature of the objects themselves, but from the person of the man or, from the person that representeth it. End quote. Thomas Hobbes in Leviathan, 1651. Quote. We have already observed, that moral distinctions depend entirely on certain peculiar sentiments of pain and pleasure, and that whatever mental quality in ourselves or others gives us a satisfaction, by the survey or reflection, is of course virtuous, as everything of this nature, that gives uneasiness, is vicious. End quote. David Hume in A Treatise of Human Nature, 1739. Quote. It there appeared that we could not, on reflection, maintain anything to be intrinsically and ultimately good, except in so far as it entered into relation to consciousness of some kind and rendered good and desirable, and thus that the only ultimate good, or end in itself, must be goodness or excellence of conscious life. End quote. Henry Sidgwick in The Methods of Ethics, 1874. Ultimately, all value derives from conscious experience, for nothing can be felt, enjoyed, appreciated, thought, or known outside of it.